There we are. All right. Excellent. We are live on Facebook this evening. Good evening, everybody. Good night if you're on the east side. Uh, good early dinner time if you're on the west coast. So happy you could join us in today. Uh, Christy with the National EMS Museum. And of course, you know, Doc Clinchy, our president. And our guest today is perhaps the oldest working paramedic in California. I'm not going to make a national claim. I'll let you do that yourself, Bob. But <laughs> I think we've got it figured out that at least the oldest practicing medic in California, Bob Fogelman. Uh, before I turn it over to these two guys who have some fabulous stories, we want to thank NAEMT for supporting the Coffee with Doc program this evening. And you can check out more at naemt.org if you aren't familiar with the National Association of EMTs. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys and sit back and giggle with my cup of coffee. Good evening, everybody. And Bob, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, for those of you that don't know how we get this program rolling, uh, we generally spend about 30 minutes together before we go live. And Bob and I have been swapping tails for a while. We're, we're both a couple of bona fide EMS artifacts. Uh, Bob's a bit younger than I am, but not a great deal. And um, so I'm going to start it off by asking Bob, tell us how you got into EMS to begin. Well, it, was, it wasn't even EMS when you got into it. How did you get started in doing what we do? Well, in, in 1960, I was uh, a voice in a, uh, in a movie that was teaching people this new uh, teaching physicians this new procedure that they just came out with and they needed to spread it around the country. It's called, um, maybe you guys have heard of it. It's called CPR. I was a voice in that. And at age 12, I learned CPR uh, for the first time. Uh, then I went in the military and I was in the, in the Coast Guard and we learned first aid, so I was 19 years old, and there was no EMS. You just did first aid. Right. Then uh, I have a 36-year career in the military, so uh, I ended up in uh, in 2003 as uh, uh, a master sergeant as a uh, flight medic in the Air National Guard. Uh, I played in uh, during Vietnam, then I went to Saudi Arabia and went to Afghanistan. Now- Got to visit well, all the garden spots, huh? Oh yeah, it's uh, the, it, mo most of the things that you see in Afghanistan are uh, expanded. Uh, you could stand any place uh, when I was in Saudi Arabia, you could stand in the middle of our of our base, and we were called King Khalid Military City, yep. and that's where they do all of the Saudi Arabia uh, officer training. Well, you could take a take a spot any place, and look at the horizon on a 30, 360 degree uh, circle, and then go to any place on that three hundred and sixty degree circle if you could find the horizon and look at another 300 you had not yet left king khalid military city right i don't want to say this place was big but <laughs> really big <laughs> really really big okay so back to the beginning um in the early days of ems in la county Tell me about some of the things you got involved with. We talked earlier about the radios. Tell me about the radios. Well, in, in the early uh, 2000s, I was uh, a paramedic with LA City Fire Department. And as such, we had our inner department uh, radios where I could talk to dispatch and they would call us out for different things. But we couldn't talk to... Uh, LAPD. And I was working in Watts at the time. Now, if you don't know about Watts, it's a um, uh, an area of 
uh, Los Angeles that has uh, a lot of gang activity. And uh, I don't care if you're black, white, purple, striped or polka dotted if if you're in a in a gang it's a gang area and we would have um two to three shootings a day and there were times that there was a lot of pucker factor one of the days i um responded on a on a, a shooting and we didn't have the cops with us at the time we go up and we see the guy who got shot and um we started working on him. This guy walks up to us and he's got this smoking gun in his hand. And he says, I shot him because I want him to die. Oh, oh, well, uh, we didn't understand that. Button up all of our stuff, drive around the corner, call for help. The cops come up, scoop up the, the bad guy, call us back and say, okay, we can go. We went in, took care of this guy and we did save his life. The amazing thing was that uh, all of this happened, but it took about five minutes from my call for help to the point where we had somebody putting out a radio call to the cops, go help these guys. Yeah. Well, I went to our boss and I said, I'd, I'd like to get a whole bunch of radios. And they said, well, we have this radio that we can give you but we don't know what we want to do with it so i said okay i know what i want to do with it i want to put pd frequencies on outside fire agency frequencies so if i'm going to interface with another uh fire agency i can do it real easily just by a twist of the knob and if it's possible i can put the base station uh radio frequencies on there well it was and we got permission to do all the, the cop stuff. So I was able to talk to the cops. I was able to talk to outside fire. I was able to talk to the base station all on one radio. The fire chief called us one day and he said, what, what's the big deal with this radio? Why should we get it? And why should we give it out to all the, all the units? And I said, with this one radio, we can talk to all the outside agencies, police and it's not necessarily just LAPD. We could talk to the California Highway Patrol. We could talk to LA County Sheriffs. We could talk to some of the little uh, cities that, that uh, LA Fire would manage their fire service, but they had their own PD. Yep. So if we had communications with all these folks, you had one, one piece of equipment, not 14 for different things that you needed. Well, the chief said, well, how much is this going to save us? Well, the radio shop said it would save us about $37 million. At that point, it was okay because he knew saving $37 million would make the bean counters happier than ever. Sure, sure. Very cool. Um, talk about the colored boxes. I had never heard that before, but that is just so cool. Well, everybody knows that D50, if you're using D50, it comes in a blue box. Why are they color coded? Well, in the very beginning of paramedicine, the folks that were making decisions said, hey, we're going to get a bunch of firemen who are going to be paramedics firemen aren't going to understand medication if we tell them to give a box a blue box for somebody who's unconscious and a known diabetic hey we're taking a dummy and you know we, most firemen have a size two head and 48 inch shoulders we can't stuff the, all this information in there so <laughs> well, somebody's having a chest pain okay well uh we'll give them a, a one of the little pills and have them stick that under the tongue and start an IV and give a red box. Somebody's in cardiac arrest. All right, we got the yellow box, the tan box and the gray box or the purple box, depending upon who your manufacturer is. That's, well, guess what? Docs didn't know anything prior to going to school either. 
Yep. Yep. So we got trained. Very true. Very interesting anecdote. Um, now your, your chart that I have a copy of here in front of me, this is fascinating. Um, explain to me the genesis of this chart. And is why. there a way that you can put it up? Um, mine is terrible. I printed out on my own office printer, but here's what, here's, where am I? Here's sort of what it looks like. Okay. Looking at this, um, on the very left side, LA Fire uses codes for the hospital. So each hospital has a number. Then I put down the name of the hospital and uh, a buddy of mine put up uh, nose, um, nose XL. I'm an XL dummy. I, I don't know squat about it. So I wasn't about to do it. I just made this chart. And when I first did it, it was the left side was was correct where uh, the hospital number, the receiving facility, the emergency room hotline numbers. And if it was a base station, it would go to their base station number. Um, and then for the other parts where the, the right side of the chart is uh, all colored, that shows which facilities or base stations or trauma centers are pediatric centers, uh, things that we would call an EDAP, which means an emergency department uh, approved for, paramed for paramedics. Uh, those places that were uh, perinatal, that had NICUs, that were STEMI centers, um, we later put in uh, Hyperbaric. stroke centers in the summer uh, comprehensive stroke centers and summer basic stroke centers. Um, to the left of the, uh, of the phone numbers, we put in specialties, Bill did. And Bill Wells was, is an amazing guy, just uh, a whiz on, on Excel. I'm, I'm lost. And uh, we would put down which places had either helipads or helispots or uh, heliports on them, what places were um, bar hyper uh, barrack chambers, and um, what places were burn centers. So with that, uh, we were able to give this to everybody on the on the uh, on a rescue, because you're going to be doing the the transportation, and if you're at the corner of walk and don't walk, uh, and you find somebody that needs to go to a specialty center, uh, a guy who has um, who has got major burns. Now in LA County. Because there are so few burn centers, what we have to do is we have to take them to the emergency room. And then the emergency room says, OK, this is a burn center. And they do a dock to dock transfer. But if we were close, we could go to that directly to that uh, burn center. We wouldn't necessarily go to the hyperbaric uh, chamber unless we were directed to do so by the base station. But this made things pretty easy. Well, LA County EMS got a hold of this and they said, hey, this, this really makes a whole lot of sense. And for the people working the hospital side of the radio, uh, these nurses are known as MICN nurses or mobile intensive care nurses who've gone through additional training and they learn how to talk to a medic, what the medics can and can't do. Um, in most of the country, you're doing your own, your own thing and you're working off the national registry. And some places are very specific and very, uh, very short on um, uh, capabilities. For those places that need direction and in the very beginning, we needed direction to give an aspirin. We needed direction to give, uh, give them oxygen. And it was a mother may I system. Yep. You had to talk to the, to the nurse and, okay, this is what we got. This is how old they are. This is what their GCS is and blah, 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 blah. And they'd say, okay, do this, go there. So we do that. And 
what what's your closest and we look on the chart if we didn't have it in our head right away and we'd say okay we we're going to go to xyz hospital so they then the hospital calls xyz hospital and says you got a paramedic rig coming in and they're going to be there in about four minutes get ready so that made things really easy as we come in with a critical patient a lot of times we had patients that had sprained eyelashes and fractured belly buttons and we didn't need that that kind of uh, sure. immediate care sure so, so la county adopted this for their base stations and on their copy it's all the hospitals within that base station's responsibility and that is now in use today correct today and how long has it been in use well, I put it together in the late 90s, and it was implemented uh, in 99 because they said, this is too simple. Let's give it to the guys, and they know who to call, what radio frequency to call on, what phone number to call, and who's got what capability. And if, if the hospital was a basic ER and they didn't have any specialties, cool. Yep. They're still on the chart. Yep. Uh, as far as going to uh, countywide, I'd say around 2005. Great. So, now, what were you doing at the time you came up with this idea? What was your role in EMS at that time? I was what we called a lead paramedic. I was the senior medic on the rescue ambulance. Okay. Uh, with LA Fire, I never went through a fire academy. They hired me as a medic. And I stayed a medic for my 30 year term with them. And you are doing what now as a medic? Now I work for a private and um, we're basically doing hospital to hospital uh, interfacility stuff. But at the time uh, I was in the trenches. Uh, I worked all over Los Angeles. There isn't a uh, paramedic ambulance that I didn't work on. Um, over time and uh, it was a great job I, I loved EMS I, I I can't believe that I'm still doing stuff in it I, I volunteer as a search and rescue tech as an EMT the county won't let me uh, work as a paramedic uh, in in that position so you spent 30 years as a medic with the system um, you were first certified for EMS in 72, you became a medic in 82. Yes. And like myself, uh, you don't know what you're going to do when you grow up either. Uh, so you're working for a private right now doing interfacility transfers. You're, you're working basically as a SAR EMT, I guess. That's correct. Correct. And what else do you do that's EMS related? Well, I work with... Um disaster communications as a ham radio operator. Okay. I work uh, with one of the hospitals here as a uh, disaster management uh, technician. Uh, I teach EMT, uh, CPR, uh, EIEIO. Uh, <laughs> picks up and I, I teach it. Um, I work with uh, LA County and their communications where I am one of their technicians uh, in a voluntary status as a uh, driver. And then I set up their uh, mobile command posts for uh, major incidents. Cool, cool. So I, I take my hat and turn it around and then I got to figure out which side is forward. There you go, there you go. So at the age of 74, you're still trying to find yourself. Is that what you're, what I... Basically, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> it's so great. Um, any other things that stick out in your mind over your career that might be um, novel or informative to some of the youngsters in our in our profession? Well, I worked. Um, I, I've worked for just a gaggle of, of different ambulance companies and seen how different ambulances were used in the in the uh, fire service uh, for one of them, every one of them uh, where I worked as an EMT, 
everything in this ambulance, which the owner built, was backwards. The bench seat was on the left side. The uh, gurney was on the right side. He had big bay windows on the right side of the ambulance. Oh, great. <laughs> there was no storage. And, you know, we had a, uh, one E-tank. And we were stuck, you know, what are we going to do? Well, we were doing nothing but interfacility stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, I've got a hypervent process that I'd like to tell you about. You like this. Everybody has their own hyperventilation process because we've all seen people. <laughs> yep. My process at one point, we were using paper bags, yep. and you'd breathe in the paper bag. And we all. <laughs> and one thing happened. They did it on a couple of people that were asthmatics, and it shut them down completely. They yep. ended up with a very adverse reaction, yep. where they died. Bad juju. My process is you just talk to the patient. And... Imagine you have, and what I've seen are basically your 17 to 25 year old female, no offense ladies, but they're the ones that have an argument with the family or their boyfriend yep. and get into this hypervent system. Yep. Well, how do we get them out of it and really keep them out of the, the ER? Because they don't need to go to the emergency room. This is something we can manage in the field. So the first thing I do is I tell them that I've seen over 100,000, now with my time and service, maybe, but for anybody, you can say, well, I've seen 5,000 people do exactly what you're doing, and we have a way of making you better. Would you like that? And, and you watch them, and they're breathing right rapidly. They're just, and, and their hands are like this, or their lips yep. are numb. Yeah. And... You say to them, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to count one to 10 out loud and speak loudly. You want to speak to the back of the auditorium. So we're going to do it and I'll show you how to do it. Take one breath. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Take one breath and do it again. What this does is it starts to take their mind off of whatever is going on in the back of their head and forces them to do the one to 10. But the first time they never get it because they go one, two, three, four. <sighs> nope, that's cheating. No more. Uh -uh. Can't do that. You got to go all the way to 10. I'm a real pain in the tush and I tell yeah. them. <laughs> so <laughs> I get them and they go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nope, you're great, but got to go all the way to 10. So third time, they get it all the way to 10. And then take a couple of breaths. No, 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 one breath only and do it again. So now you get them into this rhythm where they're counting all the way to 10, one breath, and they do it again. So you have them do it five or six times. Now go to 15. So they go to 13. Nope. Almost really good effort, but go all the way. So they go to 15, you have them do it five or six times. Then you tell them to go to 20. And I'm going to show you this. And that's what they tell me, but I'm not giving you the, the full. Yeah, full I, know, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. I know. I get it. Read so, between the lines. <laughs> yes. Line. There, there are lines there. <laughs> So they do 20, five or six times. Then I get them anything to read. I don't care what it is. Dick yeah. and Jane, the Sears catalog, the phone book, a newspaper. I don't care what it is. You have them read from the top of the left column to the bottom of the right column. And all of a sudden, the fingers start working. Why? You're having them focus on what they have to read and they're reading that out loud and they usually yep. start off in 1492 columbus sailed no 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 you got to speak to the back of the auditorium so they start using their oxygen now you can never get too much oxygen 
but you blow off your carbon dioxide. And I tell them this. It's a quick chemistry lesson. Sure, when sure. you do this, you're blowing off your carbon dioxide and you don't want to do it. And I got a gift for you because you can do this anytime you feel this thing coming on and you felt it coming on. This is your tool forever and ever and ever and you'll never feel like this again. And it gives them that control and it makes them, I'm invincible. You can get them so that they can always manage this instead of going into this hypervent. Can't find that one in a textbook, can you, Bob? No, and, and I and I showed this to a couple docs. I've got five docs that use this. Yeah. When I first showed my my partners this thing, they called bullshit on me, straight out. Yeah, this doesn't work. Yeah, they're they're. Uh, providers of this same process. Yeah. Why? Because it works. It's non-invasive. You don't do anything except you talk to them. So if you're talking to this, uh, this group, um, there, there's a thing that, you know, you're just giving them the tool. Now I have an IV trick that we didn't talk about. For those who are new EMT or new paramedics and starting IVs, because after a while, you can get an IV on anybody. But who are your two most difficult IV sticks? Dialysis and chemo patients. And unfortunately, the little old ladies with the bat wings, unfortunately, they don't, they don't use their arms. They're not using their muscles. Yeah. And excuse me while I get my my tool out. My tool happens to be really any kind of credit card. I personally like a Costco card just because <laughs> there's no value to it. If you lose it, you don't care. So a, a Costco money card or any credit card type thing. Don't use any of your money credit cards. Losing that is a real pain. Now, the really nice thing about this is after you get done with this process, take an alcohol wipe and you're good for the next patient. You're clean. Now, I'm, it's hard for me to show this, but okay, I got a, a vein. I'm going to put this right up alongside one side of the vein opposite of where I'm going to be holding my IV. Now, it does a couple things. If you get, get somebody in, you use their hand, put this on the opposite side of your IV hand. Put this on the, on the uh, vein and press down. It pops that vein up and it does two things. When you start an IV, you always pull down. You have the, the card on here. You've stabilized it in that direction. So you have it's stabilized in two different directions at the same time. Now you come in instead of instead of zoom is so much fun. Instead of straight down, you come in at a slight angle, yep. like maybe 15 degrees. You're going to get that IV. You're going to get it because it, it has no place else to go. You've got it popped up, you've got it stabilized in two different directions, and you've got the, the ease of getting it in. Costco card, my brilliant. friend. Absolutely brilliant. Yep. I, came up, I came up with this and necessity is a mother because there are times where you just gotta get the IV. Yep. And okay, so now we've got IOs. Uh, when I came up with this, we didn't have that capability. Uh, I was the king of EJs, but uh, I, had a, I had a lady one day say, I've had bilateral mastectomies. I've got nothing in my arms. You have to go EJ. Okay. <laughs> in. But, you know, that's, you, you do what you have to do. EJ, for those that are watching that don't know what you're talking about, it's an external jugular stick. It's right here. Right. And, and it, 
you can always put a, a, a big hose in there. I like to uh, say yes. that a, a 22 is a one inch fire hose. Yeah. Uh, a 20 is an inch and a half. A, a 16 is a, a two and a half. And a, a 14 is a, a four inch supply line. Yep. There you go. Good, good, par good parallel, man. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right, my friend. God, this has been great. Um, I've really enjoyed chatting with you. Uh, I think Christy will be popping back on here momentarily. And she tells me that the chart was where, Christy, for those that are watching? For those watching and those viewing afterwards, the chart you guys were talking about, we dropped onto the Facebook feed so you can uh, check it out there in all its colorful cool. glory. And um, Bob, with your permission, we'll maybe even pop it into the archives online so that it is sitting in the museum. And anybody that wants to use this concept of putting all the information on one piece of paper so that you know who specializes in trauma right. or a stroke center, or you know, if you have one hospital, they got to do it all. But you may have to call a helicopter in to move somebody. Yep. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant idea, buddy. Love it. It's Glad great. I can help. Well, you know. And I think you said it best before we even got live, but I'm going to rope you back into saying it one more time. Uh, things can go foobar, but when you go to your leadership with a solution to the foobar, systems or processes, you're going to get much further in uh, finding a solution. So yeah. all of you aspiring medics and those looking to rewrite the system a little bit, come up with a, a creative solution to a challenge. And cool. you never know, you might be in the museum too. Bob, this was great. Really enjoyed it tonight, buddy. Um, Good night, Doc. And I'm serious. When I'm out in LA, the next time you and I are going to get together for a drink or two. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, I'll send Christy my uh, contact information. Oh, she's uh, already got it. She's oh, already she's got, got it. it. She knows where to find you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I will soon. Thanks again for the time, my friend. Thank you for having terrific. me. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you are interested in supporting the National EMS Museum, please check out emsmuseum.org. And, uh, of course, we invite you all to be members of the museum. We have a few copies of the EMS Historian left, so you want to make sure to get your copy of our inaugural journal before they are gone, because once they are gone, they are gone. So check out emsmuseum.org, uh, poke around the archives and the online exhibits, and then hopefully in the next few months we'll have um, some tour dates and we'll be back out on the road. So. Yep. Thank you both for spending Friday night with us. Everybody out there in Facebook Live land and beyond, thanks for spending your Friday night with us. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Good night, everybody. Good night.